painful, it is localized and it does not spread to other parts of the body. So whenever you are like in your body also, you must be feeling like whenever you palpate, you must be feeling certain lumps and bumps in your body, but we are not worried because you know that is not cancerous. But there are diseases similarly, if there is uncontrolled proliferation in some parts of your body, it could be cancerous. So depending on the sites, depending upon the history, um, the the tumor can be benign or cancerous, right? So now today we are talking on neoplasms or cancers of the lung and the pleura. So I'll be making more emphasis of the lung and then I'll be touching a little bit on pleura as well. So this is the basic anatomy of the lung. So today we will be talking about the lung and the pleural and the visceral or the uh, parietal pleura where neoplasms can occur. So lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide and it is similar in Nepal because in Nepal also there are lots of uh, that lung cancer is also one of the leading causes of death and cancer right and as followed by the neck cancers, gastric cancers, and in the females, it's more of a cervical cancer and breast cancer. So uh, it also accounts for 95% of cancer deaths. And only 19% of all patients with cancers are alive five years or more after the diagnosis, even after the treatment, right? And the peak incidence which occur is between 55 to 65 years of age, and there is a male predominance of the disease. So what we say that, that is the male are affected more than the females. So I'm, I've put up this journal or the article, which also makes an emphasis that lung cancer is the most common cancer in the world. Okay, only like in 2012, there was 1.8 million new cases where the uh, the di like where in 2012, 1.6 million cases of lung cancer was made. So you know how the magnitude of people or the magnitude of the disease from this article, even though it is an old one. So what are the risk factors? What causes lung cancer? Like all of us know that uh, smoking is bad, right? So even smoking uh, tobacco is the most common etiological factors. And the cigarette, that cigarette contains, it's not the nicotine which causes cancer. The cigarette contains this carcinogenic chemicals, nitrosamine and benzopyrene diol epioxide. So carcinogenic chemicals or carcinogenic agents, what are they, when you see? Cancer, which the chemicals or agents that causes cancer are carcinogenic. So in the cigarette, there are these chemicals like nitrosamine and benzopyrene diol epoxide, which causes cancer, right? And the risk of lung cancer increases with the number of packs of cigarettes smoked per day and within the number of years spent smoking. So it also depends on, on the number of cigarettes that you smoke. So whenever, that's why when you, I think you are also already in clinicals, that's why you ask the patient, what is the importance of asking the patient, how many cigarettes do you have per day? And like you also, when you're presenting, you also say this many packs per year. So this is the significance of the history that you've taken in your clinicals, right? Because the risk of lung cancer increases with the number of packs of cigarettes smoked per day and within the number of years spent smoking. And the passive smokers are also affected. So those who live with someone who smoke have an increased risk of having lung cancer and further, it is complicating the problem. Cigarette also contains nicotine, which is highly addictive. So that's why we see lots of chain smokers. And most of you, like if some of you in your class smoke, I think it's high time you quit it because you're not only affecting your health, but also the ones around you. Because the risk factors, ma, there is also passive smokers who get affected, 
right? So exposure, and when we say like, it is not only the cigarette which causes, there are other factors also, but whenever a patient comes to you, some of them will say, oh, he is not, uh, he's not um, he doesn't smoke, or he's never smoked in his life, yet he got cancer. And that could be how it could be a passive because of the passive smoking, right? So exposure to carcinogens like asbestos, chromium, nickel, diesel fumes, all these could lead to cancer in a long run. And even with pe even people having chronic obstructive airway diseases and people who are exposed to radon gases, all these are the etiological factors of cancer. So <clears throat> I have broadly classified uh, the, the, the types of lung cancers like squamous, adenocarcinoma, large cell carcinoma and small cell lung cancers. Uh, so that there are other types also, but I don't want to complicate too much. I just want you to know that there are adenocarcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, large cell and small cell carcinomas, right? So this is a picture of a lung which has been, uh, which is there in the pathology department, not here somewhere, like, and then they have grossed the section. And whatever white portions that you see are the unwanted cell proliferation that we call tumor. So this is like whenever in the x-ray you see you have you see different opacifications. So whatever um, diseases that uh, whatever tumors are there, you can see it as a uh, as this grossly. So it looks like, uh, how can you describe it? It looks like it's a fungating type. It's it's overgrowth. That's this. It's like a cauliflower type, right? So the edges are all. Uh, it's not regular. It's um, scattered. All those types can be described grossly. So in the histology, these are different. This is how the different. Um, uh, cells in different adenocarcinomas, squamous, lung, and small cell carcinomas look like. So you can go into detail in your pathology how the different cells are there, right? So for all practical, uh, for practical purposes, to make it more simpler, lung cancer is divided into two clinical subgroups. One is small cell carcinoma, and one is non-small cell carcinoma. And it, a non-small cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, large cell carcinomas fall under this uh, non-small cell carcinomas. So how does it happen? But we see whenever, how does cancer happen? When they, there are different, uh, like in histology, you see different uh, changes in the cells. Like some, if you are, <clears throat> I uh, suppose, let us take an example of um, uh, oral cancer, right? So your oral mucosa is normal. So when you, if you are exposed to, if you take lots of uh, betel nut, if you are smoking a lot, no, slowly over a long period of time, what happens? Because your skin or your, your mucosa is constantly irritated by some kind of chemicals, there is a change in your, uh, in the cells. So as a result, ulcerations start to happen. So, and the cells also, the morphology also changes. So there will be metaplasia and slowly there will be dysplasia. And slowly, when the cells start to change in a, um, like change to cancerous um, uh, form, there will be carcinoma in situ. Carcinoma in situ is a most early phase of cancer and later leading to invasive carcinoma. So this is the histological sequence of events that happen, like starting from a normal epithelium, there is a change which happens as a metaplasia, dysplasia, and then carcinoma in C2 and cancer. This is exactly what happens even in lung cancer. So what are the clinical features? How do the patients present to you uh, with lung cancer? And uh, the, as I've stated, lung cancer may present in a number of different ways. You know, patients do not come to you, all the patients do not come to you with the same kind of 
symptoms or complaints. They come to you with different complaints depending upon where the tumor is located or where the tumor is involved. It may arise if it is arise if it may arise from arise from the spread to the chest wall or the mediastinum or from the distant blood. Um, born spread, what happens, it can arise from the bronchus. So if it is arising from this bronchus, the symptoms will be related to that. And if it is in the chest wall, if it is in the pleura, it is different. And sometimes the primary it, uh, lung can have uh, uh, tumors coming from different other primary organs, like a per person can have uh, see a cancer of the ovaries or cancers of the liver or cancers of the head and neck leading to lung metastasis which has spread to the lungs so symptoms will vary according to the location of the tumor especially most of them will come with cough like 80 percent of the cases will present with cough it is the most common early symptom sputum is purulent if there is a secondary infection right? And a change in the character of a regular cough associated with other new respiratory symptoms increases the possibility of bronchogenic carcinoma due to local effects of the tumor within the bronchus. So anyone who is having any symptoms in cancer, when do you have to be alarmed is whenever you have a new symptom which lasts for more than a month. You know, cough that we are coughing here, like during like um, cold seasons or cold if you have a flu or you because of irritations or allergies, you may be coughing. But that comes and goes within a short period of time. But if the symptom is persisting for a long period of time and despite the medication, if it's not subsiding, you always have to investigate. We are, I'm not saying that because you are coughing for a month, you have lung cancer. There could be other causes, but it could be one of the <clears throat> one of the uh, factors, like one of the features of of some kind of uh, diseases, which is um, which is there. Okay, so cough is one of the symptoms. <clears throat> Repeated episodes of scanty cough hemoptysis or blood streaks of sputum in smokers are highly suggestive of bronchogenic carcinoma and should always be investigated. And sometimes in 70% of the cases, patients complains of hemoptysis, which is blood in the sputum. It could be uh, fresh, it could be just streaks, which is could be seen, but it will be there. And slowly, as the disease progresses, patient will also complain of dyspnea. There will be breathlessness associated, which also reflects the occlusion of the large bronchus. Why will be there dyspnea? Because the tumor is occluding the large bronchus, resulting in the collapse of the lung or development of pleural effusion. Pleural effusion is a term used for collection of fluid in the pleural cavity. So, and that there will be pleural pain, which also reflects the malignant invasions of the pleura and reflects the infection distal to the tumor, which is recurrent and fail to resolve. So the patient will also slowly complain as the disease progresses, patient will also complain of pleural pain, which is there most of the time, like when the patient is breathing, taking a long deep breath, or while coughing. And in cases where there is a pleural or rib invasion, the patient will also complain of pain in the chest wall. This is, and if the rib is, if there is a tumor, and if it also is affecting the rib, this term is known as a pangos tumor, and it is mostly in the upper lobe. An involvement of the lower part of the brachial plexus causing severe pain to the shoulders and down inner side of the arm. So if there, it may also, the tumor may also affect the brachial plexus as will cause compression of the brachial plexus. As a result, there will be pain. So, and so most of them, when the sympathetic nerves are involved, there will be Horner syndrome. So all these, and 
What I'm, and besides this, patient will also complain of loss of appetite. There will be cachexia. There will be fever associated sometimes, you know, and there will be lethargy. So with all these clinical features, what I'm trying to say is it's not like written in the books. It's not that patient always have to come to you with cough and um, cough and hemoptysis. It, it, it could be any one of these features that patient may present with, depending upon the location of the tumor, the features are different. And if, and not all patients come to you in an early stage, right? Whenever patient, I'll, a patient come to you in an early stage, sometimes they don't have any symptoms. It could be an incidental finding, or sometimes it could be just cough and hemoptysis or just cough, which is not subsiding, right? But as the time progresses, the disease will also progress. And all these symptoms that I have just, I have just uh, referred might be the presenting symptoms of the patients, okay? And um, the disease can spread directly. There will be local invasion. The disease might spread through lymphatics and the disease might spread through hematogenous spread, which is through blood. So distant metastasis to different parts of the body might occur. So if there is a direct spread, like if it is in the, uh, if it is um, look like affecting the area surrounding the tumor, there will be recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. As a result, the patient will have unilateral vocal cord paresis and the patient will complain of hoarseness of voice. Sometimes the patient might just come with cough and hoarseness of voice. And if there is a phrenic nerve, phren phrenic nerve invasion and patient causing paralysis of the diaphragm, patient might just come with hiccups, okay? And if there is involvement of the esophagus, there will be dysphagia. Patient will have difficulty swallowing. And sometimes because uh, in the mediastinal region, the, the uh, heart is very near. So as a result, there will be atrial fibrillation, tamponade, pericarditis, pericardial effusions may be the presenting symptoms of the patient in cases of uh, local invasion. And sometimes the patient will have superior vena cable infection, obstruction, which causes early morning headaches. The face will look congested, plethoric. There will be edema of the upper limb and the face, and there will be distension of the neck veins, like the jugular veins and the veins of the chest. And the patient will be very breathless by then. So there will be like neurological symptoms there will be other like normal, uh, what you can see is digital clubbing. There'll be hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. Patient might also have thrombophlebitis, my migricans. They, they will have different symptoms, right? <clears throat> and if the bone is involved, they will have <clears throat> severe bony pains. And most of the, like it is the thoracic, uh, vertebrates which are mostly affected by cancers and liver metastasis can also occur if the patient has a liver metastasis the patient will complain of abdominal pain they'll have a stretching type of pain in the right hypochondria where the liver is situated as and the patient will constantly complain of pain there and if the patient has a brain metastasis, the patient will have uh, sleep disturbances, there will be mood uh, disturbances, like there will be personality changes, there will be slurring of speech, the patient will complain of headache, vomiting, and sometimes associated with seizures and other neurological hem hemiparesis and other focal neurological symptoms will also be associated. So, as I already mentioned, the metastasis could be through lymphatics and hematogenous spread, and the organs most affected are the adrenals, the liver, the brain, and the bone. And it can also metastasize to the, um, uh, the opposite um, uh, lungs. Physical examination. What do you see in physical examination? Those were the symptoms, like, okay, the... The examination is usually normal unless there is a significant bronchial obstructions or tumor has spread to pleura or the mediastinum. 
And on physical signs, there will be physical, there will be collapse, which may arise, which may arise to pneumonia. There'll be UVs when you auscultate the patient through your stethoscope. You can either hear the wheeze or a strider or decreased breath sounds. Okay, and you will see because of the recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, there will be hoarseness of the voice. And on if there is effusion and on dull percussion, either they will absent of breath sounds, or like if there is um, uh, a pleural effusion, the whole pleura will be uh, filled with the fluid. As a result, there will be dull percussion when you are examining the patient. And physical signs of pleurisy, there will be pain on deep inspiration <coughs> uh, or pleural effusion. <coughs> and jugular and uh, superior vena cava obstruction, the neck veins will be very much dilated, the orifice will be plethoric, there will be concession, and there will be edema of the affected face, neck, and the arms. And on bone uh, metastasis, there will be tenderness in the bones. What are the investigations that you will do? Besides the normal blood investigations like complete blood count, renal function test, liver function test, and ESR. ESR we are doing C to see whether uh, the patient has, if, if the ESR is high, we also have to think of tuberculosis because most of the time the patient comes with similar, the symptoms that the patient with lung cancer and tuberculosis present are somewhat similar. So sometimes we miss the diagnosis. So if the ESR is very high, we will first try to rule out tuberculosis and then as a, and, and slowly investigate further. So another, besides the blood investigations, it is the chest x-ray that we would do. And if the chest x-ray shows any abnormality, <clears throat> we will go to bronchoscopy. And we'll, through the bron when we're doing the bronchoscopy, we'll do bronchial washings and, and uh, brushings. And bronchoscopy is done only in the central or upper lobe lesions. Like if it is deep down in the Deep down in the lower lobe, bronchoscopy is not indicated because the scope cannot be passed uh, through the bronchus till the uh, lower lobe. So as a result, uh, like this, uh, investigations have to be uh, um, ordered depending upon the site of the tumor. And if the tumor is central or it's in the upper lobe, we can also try doing sputum for cytology for malignant cells. And sometimes if you're lucky, you don't have to invade too much with bronchoscopy or other biopsies. The malignant cells will be seen in the sputum itself. And we can other investigations we can do to confirm because we will need a histopathological confirmation before we start the treatment because there are different types of cancers like I told you, the small cell and the non-small cell cancer. And depending upon the histology, the, tum the treatment differs. So the CT guided biopsy can be done. And once the thing is, once we think that this is tumor or this is cancer of the lung, we have to rule out, we have to do a metastatic workup by doing the CT scan or MRI of the chest, the abdomen and the head to see whether the tumor is there only in the lung or it has spread to other parts of the body, <clears throat> right? And in small cell lung cancer, why head? Because in small cell lung cancer, it, there, there's a very high chance of the disease being uh, go, disease spreading to the brain. brain. As a result, when we are doing a metastatic workup, before we do the treatment, we have to do investigations of these to see whether the tumor is, uh, and also this also helps us to uh, know the stage of the tumor. What do you usually see in the chest x-ray? Chest x-ray you ordered. So what do you see? It could be a unilateral hyaluronic enlargement. There will be peripheral pulmonary opacities. There will be collapse of the lung or the segmental or the lobular collapse. You could see effusions. You will be seeing a mediastinal broadening, enlarged cardiac shadow or elevations of the diaphragm. Where could be seen and sometimes rib destructions can also be seen. So this is a picture of the 
E1, E is the picture of a chest X-ray where you can see the tumor on the right side towards the, like it's a huge tumor, right? And the others, other two, B and um, the one down below is the of the CT scan. Also, it is there, there is a collapse of the lung and there is a effusion of the right side, right lung. And the bluish one is of a PET scan. In the PET scan also, the one, the white enhanced lesion is that of a tumor. So this is the picture of a CD scan and the X-ray and the PET scan that I'm trying to show, which is of the same patient. And it shows there is a, there is a mass on the right side and it is that of a tumor. And whenever there is enhancement in the PET scan, it is most likely of the cancer. So what you can see is this is of a chest X-ray and that of a CT scan. In the chest X-ray, what do you see? On the left side, on the peripheral side, where the primary is, where the arrow is showing, there is a tumor, which is uh, well circumscribed. It's enhanced lesion. And if you look at the costophrenic angle of the right side and compare it to that of the left side, there is some blunting scene. It's not the same, is it? It's not. So there is some pathology there. So whenever there is blunting in the costophrenic angle, it is, there is effusion. So in the x-ray, you can see there is a white fluid which is collected showing pleural effusion, okay? So this is another one on the right side towards the lower lobe. There is an enhanced uh, lesion. There is uh, uh, in the infrahylar and the paratracheal and lymphadenopathies are also seen. Similarly, the CT scan confirms, the CT scan confirms the lesion on the right lower lobe and the infrahylar there is a lymphadenopathy, okay? So how do you stage the tumor? We do it by TNM staging and it is done by a CT scan or an MRI, okay? Depending on the T is for, stands for tumor, N stands for lymphadenopathies and nodes and M for metastasis. So depending upon the size of the tumor, we stage the tumor as T1, T2, T3, and if it is, uh, uh, or T4. And depending upon the different nodes that are involved and the number of nodes that are involved, we stage the M, and the M is for distant metastasis. So this is a primary tumor characteristics. T1 is less than three centimeters. So I think you can go through that yourself. And M1 and M in distant metastasis, if, if there is a pleural effusion, this is M1, okay? So M1, whenever, if it has gone to a different site, if it has, uh, if it has spread, already spread to a different site, it is always stage four disease. And, and the survival depending upon um, the staging is also different. So if it is diagnosed early, the probability of five-year survival is 48%. And in the late stages, it is only 10 to 15%. So what I'd like to say in the treatment is like cancer is like everybody is very scared to hear the word cancer. And then it, everybody thinks it is a death sentence, but it is not so. If you diagnose, if you diagnose the disease at an early stage, it can be curable. Okay. So, but most because most of the people that are not aware of the symptoms, most of the people do not know where to go. And even those and what in our third world countries, what happens is even though patient goes to the doctor, most of them are not treated appropriately. Most of them are first treated as tuberculosis and later when the disease is progressing, only later they will think that it is, it is, the, it is uh, cancer. So what is needed is we have to see, we have to visit the 
right doctors at the right time at the right place like okay so so that's why if you diagnose the disease early you can still go for surgery in the, even in cancer in lung cancers you can do lobectomy and pneumonectomy and only in late stages we cannot go for surgery and what we do is we go for chemotherapies and radiotherapy and chemotherapy and radiotherapy can be given with curative intent or palliative intent. Sometimes if the diseases are in the stage 2A or 2B stages, we try to treat the patient to cure the disease. But if the patient presents to you with advanced cancers with already having metastasis, we cannot guarantee cure because there is no cure. So in such cases, what the, the, the treatment we give is only palliative, which is to prolong the life of the patient, which is to um, uh, subside the, um, the symptoms that the patient is having. As a result, the quality of life of the patient increase improves. So, so the chemotherapy and radiotherapy can be given as a cure, curative intent or as a palliative intent. And now there are lots of developments in the field of cancer. And we are also using targeted therapies where EGFR inhibitors like tyrosine kinase inhibitors are also given. So there are targeted therapies and now there are immunotherapies, which is there. And besides all these things, palliative treatment, just treating the symptoms of the patient in late stages or end stages of the life can also be done. So after treatment, you know, at diagnosis, look at the x-ray, look at the, uh, on the left side uh, towards the cardiac shadow, there is a tumor. But after the treatment, look at the response of the therapy. So definitely, there is a very good response, right? So the small, this is a treatment, um, the, the comparative x-rays, which is showing, which is showing tumor at diagnosis and the response to the therapy, which is uh, very good. So now coming to carcinoid tumor, this is another tumor, which is one to 5%. It's seen in less than uh, more than 40 years of age. And uh, it is also, uh, seen 20 to 40% in non-smokers, and it is uh, divided into typical and atypical type, and it is there in peripheral and origin, like central and peripheral regions. Carcinoid tumor of the lung, uh, it, it compresses the bronchus, and it, the, the symptoms that the patient present is similar to the lung cancers with cough and shortness of breath, etc. And I'll be only touching on neoplasms of the pleura. And neoplasms of the pleura is uh, mesothelioma and all ewing sarcomas and other rhabdomyosarcomas, sarcomas, but it could also be a metastasis from other, uh, other cancers like neuroblastoma, Wim's tumor, and lymphomas. But today we'll, I'll shortly tell you about mesothelioma, which is um, tumors, uh, of the pleura, and it is mostly seen in people with asbestos exposure, 7 to 10%, and it is seen mostly in the, for 25 to 45 years of age. And asbestos bodies, there will be seen in the x-rays, there will be lots of asbestos bodies seen in the, in the lung field. And uh, let us not do that. And the clinical presentation, there will be chest pain, there will be cough, there will be breathlessness, and, and the patient might present to you with recurrent pleural effusion and hyaluronic lymphadenopathies, and, uh, which is seen in the chest x-ray and um, which is seen in the chest x-ray and then um, uh, and in the CT scan. And there will be uh, distant metastasis to the liver and the brain. And the prognosis is really bad. 50% of them would die within 12 months. And uh, the treatment that can be done is a uh, surgery. One is extrapleural pneumonectomy, where you can give chemotherapies and radiations. So uh, this is also uh, one of the x-rays showing uh, 
you the pleural tumors of malignant mesothelioma. And whenever the aspirate could be bloody uh, aspirate, sometimes when you are seeing the aspirate in uh, tuberculosis, there will be straw colored aspirate, right? But in malignant mesothelioma, most of the time blood uh, mixed, so it uh, the aspirate will be bloody. So I think this is it. Um, is there any question that you can you have to ask? Can anyone volunteer to say yes or no? Like, is there any question that or any queries that you want to know? Um. Yes or no? No, ma'am. Okay, I please go through. It is like it is very difficult uh, when we are going virtually because I cannot um, see your faces, etc. So as a result, like it's like a one way communication. So it becomes difficult. It is not very interactive. So I would suggest that please go through this in your textbook. And if there is, I have only um, put main focus on lung cancer and um, mesothelioma. So lung cancer, what you have to learn is what are the different types? What is the TNM staging? What are the different treatments and the clinical features and investigations? Please go through and if there is any query, you can always approach me, okay? Okay, I think this is it. I will end my class over here. You have a good day. All right. Thank you, ma'am.